Well, well, you know, it's Saturday night, and that's time for the Libertarian Conversation. Every Saturday night at this time, we come to you for two hours to talk about various matters of current interest and of historical interest, all looking at things from a libertarian perspective, which is simply how can we get things done without forcing people at the point of a gun. Well, this past week, the Bush administration submitted its budget for the fiscal year 2006, and it is a whopper. It is two point five seven trillion dollars. Two trillion five hundred and seventy billion dollars. Now, just to compare it with something I've told you several times on this show, two million five hundred and seventy billion two trillion five hundred and seventy billion dollars. And in nineteen sixty the budget was less than a hundred billion dollars. And uh, offhand I think it was about eighty billion. Now, again, two trillion five hundred and seventy billion billion. If you subtracted 1980's $100 billion budget, you're talking about a budget for 2006 that is $2,470 billion greater. You're talking about a budget that is over 25 times the size of the budget just 45 years ago. I think I may have said 1980's $100 billion budget. I meant to say 1960's $100 billion budget. So in 45 years, the budget has increased 25 times over. Inflation has increased the consumer price index about five times over during that period. So the federal government has been growing five times as fast as the economy. And it's grown five times over, even allowing for inflation. And that budget <laughs> is being touted as a slashing, budget-cutting, axe-to-the-bone budget Bush is cutting out all the fat and saying we've got to tighten our belts and so forth, and the liberals are going crazy at this terrible budget that is just gutting federal programs and so on. Now, you have to understand that this is a little dance that they do every year when you have a Republican president, and that is the Republican president submits a budget that is larger than the budget of the year before, a very definite increase, and not just a tiny little increase like 1% or something where it's just fractionally different. But a solid increase. This year, the increase is 7% over last year's budget. So the Republican president proposes this budget that's 7% larger. And he says we have to make these tough budget cuts in order to uh, try to be fiscally responsible and to do something about the deficit and so forth, knowing all the time that he's increasing a budget, that, uh, proposing a budget that's 7% larger. And the Democrats go crazy and say, oh, my God, this is terrible, this slashing, this budget cutting, this is terrible. This gonna, the poor are going to be out in the street. Our kids aren't going to get any education and so on. And as I say, this is a little dance that they do. The Republicans do it in order to make their faithful think that their president really is doing something about cutting government. And the Democrats do it to make their faithful think that the Republicans really are doing something to cut government, and this is terrible, and we need to do something about it. Oh, and oh, by the way, send us some money so that we can run good candidates in 2002 and try to get, uh, 2006 and try to get control of Congress back and elect a Democratic president in 2008. So each of them is playing to their faithful, and meanwhile, government just gets bigger and bigger. You elect a Democratic president, and government gets bigger. You elect a Republican president, and government gets bigger. You elect a Democratic Congress, and government gets bigger. You elect a Republican Congress, and government gets bigger. They reform welfare, and government gets bigger. They pass a Freedom to Farm Act that is going to phase out all farm subsidies, and government gets bigger. They make tough budget cuts, and government gets bigger. There is nothing that any Republican or Democrat is going to do to actually reduce the real size of government. What's interesting is I'm on some email list where people are arguing about what the Libertarian Party should do next, and there is a fellow who's a part of the Liberty, Liber, Libertarian, what is it called? The Libertarian Republican Caucus, I believe it is. It's working within the Republican Party to bring about Libertarian uh, goals. And he wrote a letter that went to this email list, and I received it, that said, where is the Libertarian Party on this? Here they are taking steps to reduce government, and the Libertarian Party should be applauding it. But no, nothing the Republicans do is good enough for the Libertarians, and so the Libertarians are strangely silent. And somebody pointed out that Bush's budget was proposing a 7% increase. Why should Libertarians cheer that? Well, then you should say that Bush is, what Bush is doing is a step in the right direction, but he's not going far enough. Not going far enough. So I guess that means we should say that a 7% increase is a step in the right direction, but they're not going far enough. It should be a 20% increase in the size of government. 
And, you know, this is what Republicans have been saying for years. When the Republican Congress came in in 1995, and they proposed, they passed a budget that was bigger than the year before, and people said, well, what are you doing? They said, well, you know, it took many years to make government this big. We can't slash it all at once. We have to do a step at a time. But the steps are always in the wrong direction. And now that I'm through ranting and raving about the next federal budget, let's talk with Bill in New Jersey and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Bill. Uh, good evening, Mr. Brown. What's I'd up? Like, I'd like to thank you for uh, taking my call, and also thank you for reading my email on the air about four weeks ago. Oh. Um, yeah, I had asked a question concerning what a libertarian who found himself elected to the state legislature would be able to do, and I, and I appreciated your very thoughtful answer on that. Oh, thank you. Um, I had several topics in mind. Uh, I'll start with... Uh, uh, I uh, realized that uh, with, I have several... Well, all of us have blind spots, uh, as we learn about being libertarians, and one of the blind spots I re recognized was uh, I was checking out LewRockwell.com uh, this past week on your recommendation, and uh, I found on the Tuesday uh, listing I found an article called New Worlds or New Moondoggle by Bill Walker, and this brought to my mind that uh, I had totally bought the, uh, the government propaganda on NASA way back during the moon program, and I uh, had totally bought it and was uh, accepting it totally, and... Uh, now and hadn't thought it through until I read this article and realized, yes, it's just another government program. <laughs> I, I didn't see it. That was on Tuesday on LouRockwell.com. That's know? correct. All right. Let me uh, say for the listeners that, in case you haven't heard me say this before, the LouRockwell.com is a very, very good website, not just in getting theory about different things and different government programs, but also in getting news that you may not have heard. It's all in the form of articles, commentary articles, and there will be about ten listed each day on the menu. And I always find myself reading at least half of them, and because they just piqued my interest in the and of those half, probably half of those I wind up saving. And uh, on the home page, you can see over to the left, it says last seven days. It's very easy to go back and see days that you've missed. So if you go to the site, Lou Rockwell, Lou being L-E-W, Rockwell, R-O-C-K-W-E-L-L, -L, but of course all one word, LouRockwell.com. If you go there and click on last seven days, you can then just click on Tuesday, and you'll see the article that uh, Bill is mentioning. In fact, I, what I'll do is I'll put a link to it on my uh, radio links page so that you can go directly to it. But I, once you're there, it would be a good idea to go to the home page for LouRockwell.com and explore and see what's there today. I haven't looked yet to see what's on their weekend menu. But NASA, of course, is a boondoggle, and the space program was very exciting. But it, uh, like all government programs, it wound up to be much more expensive than it was supposed to be, and it promised all sorts of developments that would lead to all kinds of of great discoveries that would enhance products here at home and so forth, and it's pretty hard to find anything that has come out of it that has got any utilitarian value to the American taxpayer whatsoever. And, of course, the same thing goes for the space lab, for the um, shuttle uh, program, uh, all of the space shuttle, all of these things uh, have turned out to be very expensive, have not delivered on any of the promises that were made for them, and so all it is is a complete waste of money that has gone out. Meanwhile, there are private companies that are developing things whereby they are only going to get paid if they actually deliver something that somebody really wants, and that's the way the market works, and that's the way the market should work. And pardon me for monopolizing the conversation, Bill, but that's the kind of guy I am. Oh, no problem, uh Listening to the program over the past few weeks, which is where I just started listening to it live, and listening to the archives, I'm very aware, and was prepared for such a situation. <laughs> uh, the two, two points from the article that I'd like to bring out is, first of all, uh, Mr. Walker uh, compares the, NAS, the, uh, the moon program to the uh, imperial Chinese from 1405 to 1420, where, they, where the Chinese government explored uh, from India to, to Africa, and then they decided, uh, we're not going to explore anymore, and just forgot about it, pretty much. <laughs> you know. And uh, pretty much we're in the same situation, where we got to the moon, and then we're done. Because uh, basically, I know and you know that the main reason we were rushing to the moon was to beat the Russians. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of good it did. And of course, uh, the space program has been dining out on that, as they say, ever since. Oh, absolutely. Meaning living off the reputation of, we got us to the moon. And it was quite an accomplishment. But of course, just because they did something that nobody else had done before, doesn't mean it was worth the money that might have been better spent doing something else, say, leaving it with the taxpayers so that the taxpayers could enhance their lives a little, instead of enhancing the prestige of John F. Kennedy and the NASA people. Yes, and, and the other point the article brought out was that uh, that one of the reasons why no no commercial venture is really interested in doing anything in space is because uh, basically it's uh, against the law to own anything beyond the atmosphere. I mean, if somebody went out and got a near-Earth asteroid and was able to bring it to Earth orbit, he wouldn't own it legally. I didn't know that. Yeah, that, at least that's what it says in the article. I don't know if that's actually the case or not. Gosh, I, better, that, I better hide that meteor that we've been keeping in the garage. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, once it comes within the atmosphere, of course, then you can own it, but... Uh, uh, that was the first topic I had in mind. The second one was uh, this, this week I tried to read a book that I got from, the, from our unfree library. Um, 
you know, they call it the free library, but it's actually unfree because we pay for it anyway. Uh, but that's beside the point. The book is called Lives My Teacher Told Me by James W. Lowen, L-O-E-W-E-N. And I don't recommend it. <laughs> and, the re- and I just wanted to explain briefly why. Uh, uh, his, it, the premise of the book is that uh, uh, high school his- U.S. history courses are terrible mainly because of the textbooks and the way they are written. And I agree with him on that, but I don't agree with his solution. Um, basically, uh, his focus is is basically on uh, uh, slavery and racism, and to the ex- virtual exclusion of everything else. And to him, uh, Lincoln is is a hero who freed the slaves, which we've heard over and over and over. And and uh, Woodrow Wilson, on the other hand, is a racist who segregated the government. He doesn't care anything else about Wilson, only that he was a racist who segregated the government. <laughs> doesn't doesn't care that a hundred thousand Americans got killed because of Wilson's policies. Just the fact that he segregated the government, and he did segregate the government. Wilson was um, a segregationist. He he was born in the South. Uh, if you call Virginia the South, and then mm-hmm. became a Northern. I hear the music, and I'm very happy to hang out if you want me to. All right, well, go ahead. Uh, yes, just two other comments on on uh, Mr. Lowen's uh, book. Uh, Finally, uh, he also doesn't seem that it's important that President Wilson's administration presided over the passing of the uh, um, income tax amendment or the uh, Federal Reserve System. Mm -hmm. And my final comment on that book is I feel that uh, Mr. Lowen's uh, version of uh, U.S. history is as fair and balanced as uh, Fox News' version of current events. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) Incidentally, about Lincoln, and I Mm -hmm. mentioned this, I think, once before, so my apologies to anyone who heard it. Uh, he, of course, always is mentioned as having freed the slaves. And there are about three things to note. Number one, when he gave his inaugural speech in 1861, he said, No southern state has anything to fear from me because I will not do anything to interfere with the institution of slavery. In fact, I can't do anything. The Constitution would not permit me to do anything about the institution of slavery. And, in fact, at the time, there was a proposed 13th Amendment, which would have made it, Uh, in the Constitution, that nothing could be done at the federal level to prohibit slavery in any state. And Lincoln said, I support that constitutional amendment. So Lincoln, while he did not personally approve of slavery, he had earlier in his life, but had come to become an abolitionist, was so while he did not personally approve of slavery, he felt and promised that he would not do anything to stop slavery. And in fact, his form of abolition was that he thought that the blacks should be shipped back to Africa and that that would solve the race problem in America. And the other thing that I wanted to, to mention is that he is called the great emancipator because of the Emancipation Proclamation. If you read the Emancipation Proclamation, you find that it did not free the slaves. It did exactly the opposite. If this Emancipation Proclamation was issued in late 1863. I don't remember exactly when, sometime between July and October uh, in that period in the fall. And the uh, proclamation says that any state, that re- uh, southern state that returns to the Union by January 1st, 1864, can keep all of its slaves and keep the institution of slavery intact. But if you do not return by then, then all of your slaves are freed. In other words, it was just using the slavery issue as a wedge or a temptation or a stick to try to get the southern states back in. And it specifically exempted certain states that had slaves. And those were, of course, the states that were on the side of the north, like uh, Kentucky and Maryland and so on, that had slaves. In other words, slaves in the northern states would not be freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. And in addition... The slaves that were in the states that were in the South that were now occupied by Union troops, where Union troops had had invaded the South and where they now occupied certain parts of the South, those were specifically exempted. And the counties where these uh, northern troops were occupying territory were listed in the Emancipation Proclamation as being exempt. So as somebody pointed out at the time, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free a single slave that it freed the slaves only in the area where the federal government, where the northern troops, the, the Union, had no control whatsoever and did not free a single slave in the areas that the federal government did control. So the Emancipation Proclamation is one of those great hoaxes of history, like King Canute having told the, uh, tried to uh, command the tides to stop, which is not what he did. He did just the opposite. He went to the shore and commanded the tides to stop, and they didn't, and then turned to his courtiers and said, see, I told you that I do not have the power to uh, stop the tides from turning, or whatever it was. But in any event, the Emancipation Proclamation did exactly the opposite of what history tries to tell us it did. Lincoln was not the great emancipator, and he was not fighting the war to free slaves. He was fighting the war to keep the Union intact so that the North could continue to bleed the South economically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mr. Lowen, when he starts to discuss Lincoln, mentions uh, both uh, the tariffs and uh, states' rights and then rejects them out of hand. So we yeah. go on and talk about slavery. Yeah, the whole argument uh, in the 
and the reason the southern states seceded. Not that slavery had nothing to do with it. It mm -hmm. just was not the primary factor. The whole argument was over the fact that the tariffs were high, and Lincoln had promised to double them, and most of the tariffs were collected from the south, because it was the south that was an agricultural uh, territory and the north was a manufacturing territory therefore the south had to buy most of its equipment and capital goods and things like that either from the north or from foreign countries and with the tariffs very high the northern uh, uh, states were sheltered in their manufacturing meaning they could raise their prices quite high and still they would be lower than the foreign ones were because of the high tariffs on the foreign products so the south objected to this they were paying these tariffs and as a result, the, the North, uh, the, the Union, in fact, was collecting all of this tariff money and then using it for what they called public improvements, which was nothing more than corporate welfare, building dams, building railroads, building various things in the North with very little of it going to the South. So the South was supporting the North, and the Southerners were fed up with it because it was draining them dry. And uh, they finally thought, with Lincoln being elected on the platform that he had espoused during his campaign, that was the last straw. So even before Lincoln's inauguration, South Carolina seceded from the Union. And once Lincoln made it clear in his inaugural address that he would not interfere with slavery, but that he would, in fact, invade the South if necessary to collect the taxes, meaning the tariffs and so forth. And that caused the other southern states to secede, and uh, the Civil War was on. And then late in the war, Lincoln started uh, promoting the idea of free freeing the slaves as a way of trying to get the support of foreign countries, who he was afraid might, in fact, help out the South. Well, there's that music again. Thanks so much for your call, Bill. Call us again, and we'll be right back. Before we go back to the phones, on the Radio Links page, I put that uh, article about Nassau from LouRockwell.com, and I just read about half of it during the break, and it is very, very interesting. I highly recommend it, uh, pointing out that despite the fact that science is much more advanced today than it was in 1969, America has never gone back to the moon and, in fact, uh, has no plans to do so and has canceled all sorts of programs along the way but continued to just spend billions and billions of dollars. And, in fact, I think uh, the author, Bill Walker, said that by now almost a trillion dollars has been spent on various types of space programs and we really have nothing whatsoever to show for it. I've also put on the Radio Links page a link to Downsize DC, which is now starting a program to get congressmen to read the bills. They want to pass a law that Congress cannot pass a bill, cannot vote on it, until two things have happened. Number one, the bill has been read on the floor of Congress, and anybody who votes on that bill has to have sat through the entire reading of the bill. Number two, once the bill has been read, seven days must be uh, must intervene before the vote on the bill to give the public time to respond to it. And this means, first of all, that no congressman can say, I voted for that, but I didn't realize that such and such was in the bill. Secondly, once they realize what's in the bill, they may not vote for it. Third, if the bill... If they have to sit through the reading of the whole bill, they're not going to pass these 300, 3,000 page bills anymore. They are going to limit each bill to one subject and make it 10 pages or whatever it is. And this is going to save us a lot of money because they're not going to throw in a lot of boondoggles on it. And fourth, it's going to give the public time to respond and let the congressman know that they don't want him to vote for this. And, of course, Downsize DC has this program whereby you go to their site, you enter your zip code, and up comes uh, an email addressed already to your congressman. So all you have to do is to enter your comments in there that I want you to vote against such a bill or I want you to vote for this bill uh, requiring the reading of the bills and so on. It's a very good program. All right. Uh, oh, I've also put on the website an article from the L.A. Times about the Bush budget, giving you a very good summary of what it's all about and pointing out that it puts the big back in big government. All right. Let's talk now with Greg in California and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Greg. Good evening. What's up? Hey, well, first I want to thank you for preventing me from voting for Ross Perot in 1996. <laughs> I voted for him in 1992 because I was under that disillusion that, you know, if you just get the right person in the government, that they'll change things. And obviously I saw you interviewed somewhere in 1996 and that uh, it destroyed that, uh, that mythological perspective on things. I want to thank you for that. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I've met you before at the Libertarian Convention in 2000. You saw my books, and I want to thank you for that. But here's my question. I typically have conversations pretty much with my brother on the whole war effort, and uh, he was in the, the Army for a little while and didn't serve any time. He was in the Reserves in ROTC in college. And he just thinks it's great that we were over there kicking some tail in Iraq until recently. Now that he realizes that there was uh, you know, no weapons of mass destruction. But he always goes back to that tired argument of, well, would you have not have gone to war against Germany so in, in World War II? He always falls back to that one. And I don't really have a good argument for that one. I know you talk about, uh, you, I listened to your Richard Mayberry discussion where because of the two-front war, you know, he was doomed to never take over the world, but I don't know if that's going to be a good enough persuasive, in a persuasive uh, manner to turn his mind or someone else's for that manner. Well, the first thing is, of course, what I've mentioned often, and that is there would have been no Hitler if America had stayed out of World War I. That's, that's correct, but being, uh, you've got to use the economist approach, but that's a sunk cost. In other words, 
I'm, yes, I'm, nothing you can do about it. I'm, once... I'm FDR in World War II. What am I going to do now? Right. Yeah. Well, well, secondly, uh, World War II was really World War I repeated again. The war ends, and none of the goals, none of the promises were reached. Uh, not only did Germany not have the capability of conquering the United States or the world, but it left half of Europe uh, occupied by the Soviet Union. So once again, it didn't turn out the way it was promised. Uh, the, Europe was not freed, neither was China freed, which was uh, the ostensible reason that we got into the war with Japan. Uh, Roosevelt was browbeating Japan all through 1940 and 1941 to get out of China and out of Indochina. So then finally, uh, when it became apparent that this was going to lead the war, that the United States was not going to let up, and the Japanese had to have some of this territory to try to supply the resources that the British, the Dutch, and the French had cut off from them because those countries owned most of Eastern Asia at the time. Uh, then, of course, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor because they thought war was inevitable and they wanted to get the jump on the United States. Uh, a fellow whose name escapes me at the moment, I'll remember it later, in his book said that wars almost always start with a weaker country attacking the stronger country because they know that war is inevitable and they have to get the jump on them in order to make up the difference in size. Yeah, and Greg Guy went on and on and on about the Japanese and the Germans and so forth, and you can't do that in your discussion. I'm going to give you a shortcut. Okay. Uh, here's, here's the way I talk to your brother. All right, let's say that America was completely justified in going to war with Germany and Japan and that it was a wonderful thing that we did and that the world would be so much worse off if we hadn't. I don't believe that, but let's just assume that that's true. That doesn't mean that any war that any U.S. president wants to start is justified. It doesn't mean it at all. If tomorrow Bush said he was going to invade Canada uh, because he's got the feeling that there's somebody up there in Quebec that may be making some nuclear weapons or something else or got some anthrax or something, you'd say, hey, wait a minute, stop. You wouldn't say, well, if we hadn't gone after Hitler in World War II, we'd all be speaking German now because that would be irrelevant to the case at hand. And the fact of the matter is that all of these countries that the United States has invaded, Panama, Grenada, uh, Iraq, firing missiles at Sudan, invading Afghanistan, bombing Libya, and so forth, not one of those countries has threatened the United States in any way. We went after Hitler two years after the, the war started in Europe, and it was uh, very, very obvious that Hitler was on the march. We went to uh, war with Japan ten years after the war between Japan and China started, and Japan was starting to aggress against countries in East Asia. Those things are completely irrelevant to what our president is doing. That makes sense, but as um, far as the, the German situation, uh, you know, it can be shown that they were developing nuclear weapons, so how do you argue against that one? Who, who was? That the, the Germans were having a nuclear, uh, they were trying to develop a nuclear bomb. Yeah, and they, they got nowhere with it, and our people knew that. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, as a matter of fact, the German scientists were stringing the, uh, uh, the Nazis along, uh, telling them that there, it was possible within a few years to produce nuclear power, meaning electricity and so on, but that it was impossible to produce a bomb in anything less than about 10 years. And the Americans knew that because the German scientists were in touch with Niels Bohr, who was in occupied Denmark, and uh, he was a, the reigning physicist sure. of the world. And Bohr then escaped from Denmark and came to the United States, and he told the American scientists, and I think he even had a, a meeting with Roosevelt. And in any event, he told everybody that uh, it was very, very unlikely that Germany would have a, an atomic weapon. Um, anyway, uh, thanks so much okay. for your question, Greg. Uh, stay tuned. We still have another hour to go. And I got a note from uh, Gene out there in cyberspace who says, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1862 after the Battle of Antietam which was in September of 1862 and went into effect in January of 63. I had it all one year later than that, and Gene is right, I checked. And I also am in the process of putting the proclamation up on my website and linking to it on the Radio Links page. And as of the next segment, it will be up there so that you can actually read the Emancipation Proclamation for yourself. And we have an email from Jerry in cyberspace who says, I think it is a bit unfair to call the budget a whopper. Whoppers are only a dollar or so. So I think we should call it the $2 trillion whopper budget. And he's right. I think it is an insult to whoppers, which I enjoy eating, along with Big Macs, whatever Wendy calls theirs, Captain D's, all kinds of fast food I like. And I feel very, very ashamed for associating the word whopper with something so overgrown as the George Bush budget. Jerry also says, what do you think of the Ward-Churchill thing? I think he's wrong, but I don't care if he says it, but what do you make of all the media hoopla? Well, first of all, I have to admit that I have not followed it terribly closely, but I have seen a few things about it. Uh, Ward-Churchill is a professor at the University of Colorado, and please, if anybody notices that I'm saying anything incorrectly about any of this, either call me or email me so that I can make the correction before the show is over. But this is my understanding. Ward Churchill is a professor at the University of Colorado. He claims to have some Indian blood in him, and he has made uh, various uh, controversial statements about 
Indian his history and the white man taking the property and so forth. But his most controversial statement has been that he said something to the effect that the 3,000 people who were killed at the World Trade Center deserved it, which is the way I've heard it. I believe he probably made some kind of inflammatory statement in some speech, and when called on it, he tried to explain and softened it a bit, tried to explain. And the other night, this is very interesting, the other night on Fox News, it was the Brit Hume show, and he had a panel of moral eyes on um, Morton Kondraki and Juan Williams. And they showed a clip of Ward Churchill in which he said that given all that the American government has done around the world about its very aggressive foreign policy of overthrowing governments and invading other countries and so forth, it was inevitable that something like 9-11 would happen and that people would inevitably die sooner or later. When the clip was over, Hume then asked each of the three panelists what they thought about what Churchill had said. Kondraki referred to Churchill as having said that the people who died on 9-11 deserved to die. That uh, No, and he, pardon me, I think it may have been that he said that the attack was justified. Well, I saw the clip, and Churchill did not say it was justified. He said it was inevitable, which is quite different. If you poke a tiger with a stick and then he claws your face, you don't say that it was justified, but you say it was inevitable that he would do it if you rouse the sleeping tiger. Uh, and that's what happened. It was inevitable that something was going to happen sooner or later. But that doesn't mean that the people who are the innocent victims of all this deserve to die. It doesn't mean that the, what the enemy or the opponents did was right or justified. It just simply means that it was inevitable that sooner or later some thugs would get the support of well-meaning people around the world, enough support to attack the United States and try to get even with us for all the things our government has done. And one of the worst things about all of this is that it is always the innocent who wind up paying for the sins of the guilty. It was not the people in the World Trade Center that invaded Panama or Grenada or, Af or well, Afghanistan, uh, had interfered in Afghanistan during the 80s. It was not the people in the World Trade Center who overthrew the government of Iran, who fired missiles into Afghanistan and Sudan or bombed Libya or sent Marines to Lebanon. It was not the people in the World Trade Center who were responsible for all the killing that took place in Indonesia in the 70s. But they are the ones who had to pay the price for what the people in the Pentagon and the White House had done over the last 50 years. And that is really tragic. Getting back to Ward Churchill, he probably said a few things he now regrets. He may have said other things, many other things, that I wouldn't agree with. It was interesting that each of the three panelists on the Brit Hume show said that Churchill had a right to say what he believed, but that he was loony and that they hoped that the University of Colorado would fire him or find a way to get rid of him because they didn't want children being taught the kind of things that Ward Churchill was saying. Well, I've told you a lot and very, very little. But here, to me, is the essence of all of it. And that is, any time somebody on the left says something like that, the people on the right make a case of it. This is a way that they can fundraise. I can guarantee you that letters have already been printed and are in the mail from various right-wing organizations quoting Ward Churchill and saying, this is what is going on on our college campuses today. Send us money, and we will fight this. They love this kind of thing. They love these words out of, out of left-wing people because they can fundraise on them. They can get people all excited about them. And, of course, the same thing goes true on the other side. Uh, people on the left and liberal organizations try to pick things many times out of context that right-wingers have said in order to raise money. I'm more familiar with what the right-wingers do because somehow or other I've been on more of their lists over the years. But I would say very, very definitely that the whole thing about Ward Churchill is a tempest in a teapot. Eric writes to say, Come on, Harry, don't you think a couple of hundred billion is a bargain to NASA for all those snazzy postcards and dorm room posters of moon and planet pictures that NASA sells? Um, well, let's see. No, I don't think it's a bargain. A couple hundred billion is too much. Maybe 50 billion for all those posters and planet pictures and postcards and so on. But not a couple hundred billion. That's really excessive. We need a president who will be really tough about this and cut that budget back by $100 or so. And we'll talk with Roger in Clymer, New York. Good evening, Roger. Well, good evening, Harry. Thanks for taking my phone call. A pleasure. Harry, something amazing happened this week. I bet you'd be totally shocked. I'm all ears. Well, the government... Well, not entirely, but uh, okay. it's an expression. The government sat there, according to the New York Times and the Washington Post, it said that that Medicare drug benefit package okay. <laughs> would cost $720 billion, which is all only about 
almost double what they assumed it would cost when they passed it back in 2003. Yeah. But, of course, the numbers... Administration officials say the numbers aren't comparable. <laughs> yeah, right. Let, let me interrupt you. When when Medicare was first passed in 1965, and I don't have these exact figures at the tip of my brain, but they estimated that it would cost so much in 1990. They were projecting this forward. And in 1990, if you look back and adjusted what they said to $1990, it was something like $12 billion that Medicare would cost in 1990. But it actually wound up costing 90-something billion dollars, uh, just about seven or eight times as much. Now, the interesting thing about this Bush prescription drug bill is that it hasn't even started yet and the estimate has gone from 400 billion to 520 billion and now to 700 and what is it 40 billion dollars and again it doesn't really matter though does it because you know whatever the estimate will be it'll end up being more than that right but the interesting thing is that it has now been estimated upward twice and the program hasn't even started yet whereas with the first medicare program it was only after the program started that they saw that it cost more than they said that it would but now they're even saying it's going to cost more before they even put the thing into play so god only knows what it's going to be by the time they actually get started it, it's i forget when it's due to start uh, next year or something like that but this is going to uh, cost money it's a 10-year projection and the reason they said that the that it was 400 billion was they were projecting from the time they passed the bill to 10 years forward which included two years in which the thing wouldn't even be in operation so then when they instead projected it from the start of the program 10 years forward they came up with 520 but that wasn't even accurate and now they're saying 740 and by the time the bill starts they may be up to a trillion dollars whatever it is it's going to cost us plenty it's going to make prescription drugs harder to get it's going to be an enormous boondoggle and we're going to be wishing within two or three or four years that we could get rid of it somehow but now that it's in play people are dependent upon it we couldn't possibly pull the rug out from under them so we're just going to have to live with it for the rest of our lives and the beauty of it is, is you know, where is that money going? It's going to uh, TV advertising telling you to, to go tell, to ask your doctor about these various drugs. Yes, it, of course. It, you know, you know, please, we need these. You need these drugs because it could cure this thing, but let's not tell about all the... Oh, uh, watch for like these 50 side effects that... Um, We'll mention at the tail end of the commercial. And, and, you know, we have no idea what else was in that bill unless we're willing to take the time to sit down and read it, and it's probably hundreds of pages long. I just found out recently that the, the act, the bill, that set up the Homeland Security Department includes a provision that pharmaceutical companies are shielded from lawsuits in certain cases. Uh, in other words, they have limited liability. It has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Homeland Security, but it was in that Homeland Security bill plus probably a new library for Crawford, Texas. Well, well, see, the beauty of this is, is, see, we expect the politicians to lie to us about you know, benefits of a program or this, that, or the other costs or whatever. But it's getting kind of ridiculous when the politicians are starting to lie to each other. Yes, of course. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, Roger, thanks for uh, bringing us up to speed. And um, let's uh, go right now to Tennessee and talk with Buddy. Good evening, Buddy. Good evening. Uh, well, I, I wanted to maybe change uh, the subject a little bit here. Um, I've been watching the news here in the last couple of weeks, and um, I really didn't learn of the radio program or, or Alex Jones's website until just a couple of days ago. Well, you know, don't and, you, that this isn't the Alex Jones show? Yes, I know. It's okay. not the Alex Jones show. Okay, good. Um, there's a, in the world, it, it, it is really beginning to concern me about what's happening on a global scale. Uh, I've seen that in Canada and the U.K. laws have been passed um, saying that the Bible is hate speech. And also, recently in Sweden, uh, a pastor has been jailed for publishing a sermon in a newspaper uh, um, speaking out against uh, a Christian view on homosexuality. And, and what really concerns me is that's happening there. It's happening in the U.K. And then uh, we also have the situation with uh, the one pastor that's uh, uh, being prosecuted by the uh, uh, incident that he had in the city of Philadelphia. For doing what? For protesting uh, during a uh, an outfest or a gay um, uh, a, celebration. A, a gay rally? A gay rally. Yeah. Well, first of all, other countries have never prized themselves on having complete freedom of speech and freedom of protest and press and so forth. Um, things have always been more limited in most other countries of the world, especially in Britain. Britain really does have some onerous provisions, uh, stopping people from printing things and uh, speaking out against the government and so forth. So we shouldn't be too alarmed by what's happening in other countries. What's happening in this country is, of course, of great concern to us, and freedom of speech is not absolute here either. I don't know anything about the situation in Philadelphia, so I can't comment on it, but I do know that in many ways 
uh, we are being uh, monitored more, we are being eclipsed more, but I don't think we need to worry about religious freedom in the United States. Compared to other countries of the world, we're in great shape, and I don't see any deterioration in that. I don't see any trend taking place. If you have something further to say on that, stay tuned, buddy, until we come back from this break. I really don't think religious freedom is in any kind of jeopardy in this country, and I believe, I have to say, that conservatives are using this the same way, as I mentioned, they're using the Ward Churchill case, the way they use Hillary Clinton, again, as a way of getting alarmed and saying our, we're really uh, threatened here by the left and we've got to do something about it and so forth. And I do not see the suits about one nation under God or the creches in the city squares or anything of having any real power whatsoever. Uh, here and there, uh, city government might be cowed into removing these things, which is probably the right thing to do. They are using public property, property paid by the taxpayers, and they really have no right whatsoever to use that property for their own uh, religious purposes or for anything that is of their own opinion and their own desires. They're there supposedly to serve the public. And religious freedom itself, the ability to go to any church you want without having to uh, register your religion with the government, which is the case not only in places like China, but in many European countries, uh, none of that is even threatened in this country. And I, I really don't believe that religious freedom is under fire in the United States. What do you think, buddy? Well, it's, it's not really it's not really about religious freedom. It's oh, more why about, did I go on and on? Well, and on about it, it? well, I mean, religious freedom is important, and that's probably that's the first part of the, the the First Amendment, and the other part of the First Amendment is also the, the freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. But, but also, freedom of religion also goes hand in hand with freedom of speech. So that uh, one of the charges that's rallied against the people in, in Philadelphia is uh, that the Bible is being classified as an instrument of hate, which that concerns me because. Now, if the Bible is an instrument of hate, then what other book is an instrument of hate? Is it next to the Koran? Is it next whatever the Buddhist texts are? Is it next Uncle Tom's Cabin? Well, many, many novels could be considered instruments of hate under those uh, standards. And the thing is, is when you start classifying uh, a different document as an instrument of hate, um, or, or as hate speech, uh, where does it end? Does it end in a Nazi rally with uh, a bonfire and people throwing books into a fire? And that, and that we do have a history of in this country. In World War I, there were many bonfires around the country where German texts and books about Germany and German history and so forth were thrown into the fire. And in the Civil War, which we discussed earlier in this show, uh, free speech was uh, heavily under fire. People were sent to prison for protesting against... People in the North were sent to prison for protesting against the war, just as they were sent to prison in World War I for protesting against the war or protesting against the draft. And we did not have as much of that that I'm aware of in World War II as we did in World War I in the Civil War. But there is that history and that precedent there, and that precedent is important. If a case... If, if somebody should be prosecuted for protesting the war in Iraq and the case went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would look at the precedents and they would see that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is supposedly that great liberal and believer in the Constitution, especially the civil rights parts of the Constitution, civil liberties part, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the, the majority decisions that uh, justified putting people in prison for protesting against the war or protesting against the draft. So it would not take much to bring back those days in this country, and that, I think, is a very tenuous read that we're hanging on to there as far as freedom of speech is concerned. So I agree with you in being concerned about that. Yeah, there's, there's, it, it's just really, it's just really frightening how close to the edge that we really seem to be. And, uh, go ahead. I, I'm 35 years old. Uh, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Navy. Um, and I don't ever remember ever seeing news or watching events unfold in this type of manner at any one time in my life. I, I can't remember uh, um, anybody ever being uh, uh, having charges brought against them or, or uh, uh, being arrested for uh, um, speaking out uh, from one point of view or, or any other point of view. I don't ever remember seeing that or ever remember studying that in school. That could be, I don't know. Well, state in history, it, it, there's a lot of things to check it up to. Sure, you need to find out more about the specific situation, though. Sometimes we hear about people being denied their their rights of free speech when all they're doing is disrupting somebody else's meeting, somebody else's event, and that sort of thing does happen. And sometimes it happens that a city council meeting is disrupted because somebody wants to protest something and wants something to be heard and he's not on the agenda. Or it may be that somebody is protesting somebody else's rally. And I, I don't know that that applies in Philadelphia. But what happens is the supporters of the protester then say he was denied his free speech rights when what it was was that he was denied access to somebody else's property where somebody else was holding a rally and he was not invited. And so you need to find out. Uh, I haven't seen too much of that. But, uh, again, you know, we're always on the verge of that. And... 
the civil liberties parts of the Constitution have been respected more over the last 50 years than, of course, the economic parts of the Constitution. Bush just submitted a $2.6 billion trillion dollar budget, and probably only about $2.2 trillion of that is uh, justified by the Constitution. It's spending that's authorized uh, that Congress can do according to the Constitution, and the rest of it is all unconstitutional. And there's no big hullabaloo about that. But there is a big hullabaloo when somebody's civil liberties seem to be invaded. But that doesn't mean that those civil liberties are safe, so you're right to be concerned. Thank you very much for your call, buddy. Let's go to North Carolina now and talk with Philip. Good evening, Philip. Yes. What's on your mind tonight? Uh, I was uh, actually going to call about um, security. Um, I haven't been able to catch the show for the past few weeks or even for the most part tonight, Um, but I know it's been talked about quite a bit lately. Um, I'm a student at UNC Chapel Hill, and I actually write a uh, weekly um, opinion column from a libertarian standpoint in the uh, campus newspaper, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the things is I'm, uh, is the music coming on? Yes, it is. Uh, you want me to wait through the break? If you don't mind, uh, Philip, okay. I'd appreciate it. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay, um, well, what I was going to say is um, I was talking to a friend about an article I'm going to be writing on Social Security, and uh, he brought up an interesting point that uh, I haven't heard discussed um, against the Social Security plan, even by a libertarian, and uh, it kind of goes in with um, something I've heard you say often before, where uh, with you know, private schools, once they started getting federal money, get hooked on it, and it leads to greater uh, regulation by government of schools, and uh, also how um, many years after a new government program is instituted, um, it starts to be used and abused by politicians in ways that nobody ever imagined. And um, what I think is very possible to happen is that once we start investing um, all this money in you know, um, the stock market and other uh, investments, um, and basically, um, as again, like you said before, it's going to be companies who have the most political influence, um, who's to say that that's not going to lead to more government regulation of these businesses um, they could provide the convenient excuse that, well, you know, we've got all this retirement money um, pumped up in your business, in these businesses. A lot of people that are going to be retiring depend on it. We can't trust you uh, companies to just act on your own and perhaps, you know, another Enron or WorldCom happens if people lose a lot in the stock market. Sure. We're going to uh, just increase control over you because we just can't trust you. And Well, the government will, will, through the mutual funds that it sets up, if it's going to do it like the government employees program, which is what Bush suggested, and right. somebody who explained this program the next day suggested, if they're going to do that, they're going to own a lot of shares in those companies. Right. And when they uh, go to the board, of, not the board of directors meeting, the stockholders meeting, they're going to have a tremendous amount of influence. And they can right. even at some point say, well, we want some of our people on the board. And those people may be government employees or they may be people who are friendly to the government. But it's right. a bad situation anyway you look at it. Plus, would you want George Bush to be your investment advisor? <laughs> the, the guy failed at every business he was in except one where he was able to get the government to finance a stadium exactly. for him. Exactly. Uh, so that, that was just the uh, one point I wanted to bring up, and uh, I thank you for letting me have, uh, have me on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the comment, and good luck to you there. At uh, Where are you, at Chapel Hill? At uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the, uh, the Tar Heels, and uh, I write, like I said, I write a libertarian opinion column for the uh, campus newspaper, the, uh, the Daily Tar Heel. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. All right, let's uh, go quickly now to Matt in North North Carolina, in, in North York, in New York. Uh, Matt, are you with us? Hey, how's it going, Hank? I'm just fine. What's up? Hey, I'm a, I'm a 17-year-old libertarian. Mm-hmm. I have uh, two, just two questions. First one's an easy one. Um, what's your opinion on the Austrian School of Economics? I've been looking into it. Um, seems long good. What do you think about it? Well, for anybody uh, listening who doesn't know what that means, the Austrian School of Economics is really the free market school of economics, even more free market than the Chicago School of Economics, which is represented by Milton Friedman. Uh, whereas, And I have a great deal of respect for Milton Friedman, so I don't want this misunderstood. But whereas Friedman thinks that there are certain things that the government ought to do, the Austrian position is that there's nothing that the government does that is useful, that is successful, that delivers on its promises, that doesn't involve the initiation of force, and that the free market can always do things better than the government can. And uh, Obviously, the Austrian school is the school that I'm partial to. It's another. The Austrian school of economics is another way of saying the free market school of economics. So you agree with their, uh, the business cycle theory and everything? Uh, yes, uh, I don't necessarily agree with the explanation of it. Um, I, I have a great respect for Murray Rothbard. I knew him personally. Uh, he's now deceased, unfortunately. Uh, but in America's Great Depression and in some of his other writings, he described how uh, intervention in the market and monetary policy leads to depressions and recessions and so on. And I believe that he, his explanation was very, very complicated. It was essentially correct, but it was much overcomplicated and didn't need to be uh, so complicated that there are much more direct, simple Occam's razor type explanations that will show why government intervention and monetary policy lead to the business cycle and so on. And I think, uh, uh, to a certain extent, von Mises explained it more simply, but even he was a bit too complicated with it. But I agree with their conclusions very definitely. All right, the second question. Uh, generally, when debating with people, uh, something that's been brought up fairly often against me, you agree that the initiation of force is always wrong, correct? Yes, I, and you can say that it's wrong either on moral grounds or on utilitarian grounds because it doesn't lead to good results except maybe for the person who actually has a gun in his hand. 
right. I know you. I know you address natural rights, so I'll just talk in utilitarian grounds. Something that people often bring up, again, just to repeat, something that I usually come into contact with when I'm arguing with people, it's that totally invalidates the non-initiation of force principle. Mm-hmm. Somebody will say to me, say, and just disregard the circumstances, like even regardless of how impossible this may seem. Say there's a, a nuclear bomb in New York City, and uh, the key to unlock the bomb or to disable the bomb is in somebody's apartment. The only way to get in is to break in. To break into his house, he's not there, you don't have his permission. Yes. Is it legitimate to... This is what is called a lifeboat question. In other words, create a situation where you're out in the ocean in a lifeboat with somebody else. Does he have the right to drill a hole in his end of the lifeboat, uh, which might wind up drowning both of you? In other words, some impossible situation that is not likely uh, to come up, but is used then to justify all sorts of other kinds of interventions. It's like uh, what came up earlier with the question about World War II. All right, suppose it was all right to go to war against Germany and Japan in World War II. That doesn't mean it's all right to go against the war against Iraq today. It doesn't mean that it's all right to invade Iran. It doesn't mean it's all right to do uh, any of these things our government has been doing today because the circumstances are not the same. So even if you believe that it would be all right to break into somebody's apartment and get the keys to disable the nuclear bomb, that doesn't justify taking somebody's property through zoning laws. It doesn't justify uh, taking uh, nearly 50% of our income in taxes. It doesn't justify some idiot bureaucrat in Washington who knows nothing about finance regulating a mutual fund and telling a mutual fund what it must do in its advertising and so on. And we have to recognize some of these uh, cases that are thrown at us as these lifeboat cases and go ahead and concede it say all right under those circumstances but even then there should be some kind of monitoring of it in other words some kind of approval must be gotten before somebody has a right to do that otherwise people will call every situation a lifeboat situation and use it and uh, as an excuse to uh, trample on our property trample on our freedom and trample on our lives matt thanks so much for the call thank you, Harry. And thank you for listening tonight i look forward to talking with you again next week but don't forget to do something good for yourself and your family this week. This is Harry Brown. Good night.